welcome everyone to this live episode of Geospatial Distancing. I am your usual host, Abby Lehman with L3 Harris Geospatial. And today we're talking about wire, wildfires, um, potential current uses for remote sensing technology before, during, and also after an event. So I'm actually, we're doing something uh, kind of new today, which is that one of our panelists is having an issue joining the Zoom call. So let's see, let's test how good we are on our feet, shall we? Um, I will be joined hopefully eventually by two panelists today. Uh, they're both remote sensing experts and they've had up close and personal experiences with catastrophic wildfires. Um, I'll go ahead and introduce Amanda because she's here. Um, she's a familiar face around here. Uh, we just keep asking her back. <laughs> she's that good. She has been with L3 Harris uh, Geospatial, sorry, I'm getting messages. She's with L3 Harris Geospatial for 15 years in one form or another. She did step away briefly in 2019 uh, when she joined Teledyne Brown Engineering as the Director of Geospatial Solutions, supporting the DSIS hyperspectral mission on the International Space Station. She also happens to live up in the Boulder foothills, which means that she has experienced um, with her fair share of wildfire threats. She's been actively involved with local wildfire mitigation, prevention, response, and recovery efforts nearby. Say hello, Amanda. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me back, Abby. It's always good to see you guys. I didn't mean for that to be such a mouthful of an introduction, but it occurred to me as I was part of the way through it. This is a mouthful, but you deserve okay. it. It's, like, it's all good, it's all good. <laughs> so our other panelist, if she's going to be able to join today, uh, was going to be Krista West, uh, University or San Diego State University doctoral program. Um, she was a speaker at our spectral sessions virtual event, and uh, she basically talked about her whole project that she is working on right now that has to do with, uh, is it mitigation or prevention more, Amanda? It's a little bit of both, um, but yeah, looking at uh, vegetation that could potentially accelerate fires and um, are non-native, especially in the California area where we know there's quite a large fire risk, and she can certainly explain it better than I can when she joins, but um, you know, she's using hyperspectral, multispectral data to look at different types of plant species, which is a really amazing use of remote sensing. So I want to uh, add first that we are going to have the lovely Matria with us, um, helping to monitor the Q&A. She's my co-host and she will be directing questions um, to panelists or just Amanda, we'll see. Say hello, Matria. Hello. So on that note, uh, we encourage you to submit your panelist questions throughout the webinar and you'll wanna use the Q&A button found on the bottom of your Zoom interface. And as always, we are recording this episode and we'll notify you once that recording is available to view. So I guess I will just jump right in uh, with Amanda. Do you wanna give kind of a brief synopsis of your experience you know, as someone living in these high-risk areas for wildfires? And I know you've done a lot of work directly at a community level. Can you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, thanks, Abby. Um... So yeah, in, in addition to uh, weed whacking around the perimeter of our house every summer, um, you know, we live in the Boulder foothills. We evacuated for the Four Mile Fire and have been pre-evacuated for a number of other fires. So, you know, it keeps life interesting, but the value of kind of living in that wild urban interface, um, the wooey as it's known <laughs> colloquially, um, has definitely, the, the benefits out, outweigh the risks for us in a lot of ways, but you can be really cautious and careful about your risks. And in our case, we're, we're well mitigated with trees and then we do, um, you know, bushwhacking around the bottom of our house so that we, we have minimal fuels to, um, uh, to cause any kind of harm to our home. Now that said, you know, I can look across the street and I can see neighbors who don't necessarily have that level of mitigation and that's concerning to me. And that's where you start to take a bigger remote sensing picture because you can assess communities that are well mitigated or not well mitigated with a number of different technologies, whether it's multispectral or hyperspectral data that would give you more of kind of like tree species type things. LIDAR can give you more information about biomass 
Um, even SAR can give good information, especially in areas like Oregon and Washington that experience you know, some very significant fires in areas that are typically very cloud covered. Um, so it's possible that the biomass wasn't as well assessed in those areas. I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not an expert on those areas. Um, but SAR definitely can play a new role, I think, because we're seeing fire in places where we don't typically see quite as, as hazardous situations. Um, you know, Canada is a, a good example. They, they do use SAR quite a bit for, for fires, especially in the northern part of the country um, where, yep, it's cloudy a lot of the time. And um, it's also a high solar angle, so they, they can at least get uh, a little bit better coverage with that type of instrumentation. Got it. Um, and, you know, when I talked to you and Krista, when we were preparing for this episode, you guys talked about breaking it down into four, you know, stages of a life cycle of a wildfire, um, mitigation, preparation, active response and recovery. Can you expand upon that? Yeah, uh, definitely. So the way I kind of look at, at, at fire or any kind of disaster management, you have kind of that mitigation phase where let's say even, you know, hurricanes, I grew up in Florida, you're going to, you know, take care of making sure you have good windows, you're going to make sure you don't have a lot of things that could, you know, fly into your home, or um, you're going to take steps to, to make sure you've got candles, that sort of thing. You know, the, the preparation phase is more like something is happening and you need to do something about it. So that can be, you know, facing your car outward from the driveway in a fire situation, um, making sure you're all packed and ready to go in um, when you're, you're warned that you may be evacuated. Um, you know, so those are kind of, in my mind, two distinct um, elements of disaster prep. And especially with fire, that mitigation piece is so important to, you know, trying to prevent something from happening to begin with. But we know we live in fire climax communities. We know we have species that that's the way they reproduce. Their pine cones open with heat. So you, you have to take care of those if you are living in those situations so that you have a lower risk that when it comes time to prepare, you actually don't have that much to do. It's just kind of getting yourself ready to leave or getting your family together and all of your, you know, your fire safes, that type of thing. You have the actual defense of, you know, the actual event of that occurring. And especially with fire, um, a company that we've worked really close with at, at L3 Harris is called Range and Bearing. I encourage you to take a look at their webpage. Um, they have thermal sensors on a plane that can see through a pool of smoke and using GPU ortho rectification can stream that information down to the ground within minutes using like an air cell. So basically people can get fire perimeter information very quickly that can guide asset response, um, like uh, slurry dropping, um, also warning of ground staff of where they are relative to the fire perimeter, which in rugged terrain can be sometimes very difficult. And then lastly, you have recovery. One of the um, big things people don't think about is the fact that you have fires in a very oftentimes steep area. I mean, the ones in Colorado are gonna be really difficult this next summer. Um, even like the big snow we had this past week when it melts quickly and then you have runoff, but you don't have vegetation to stabilize the, um, the soil. And so that can lead to landslide events that can lead to blocking of creeks or rivers, which can then lead to floods. So there's a lot of things that can happen on the other side, not just in, you know, people going back to their homes and, and having to fix things that, um, that uh, not, not just having to fix what's wrong with your home, but it's the whole environment around the area that, that takes that kind of recovery. And remote sensing, again, can help in that area in determining how bad the burn was using like a burn severity index. And then you can also merge that with like the slope and aspect to determine what areas are going to be most impacted by that kind of um, post fire fire flood event. Sorry, I forgot my mute button there. We're falling apart here on geospatial distancing today. Woo! Well, that's you know, if this is our geospatial water cooler, sometimes people like get caught in a meeting and. <sighs> Sometimes it doesn't all go according to plan, right? Yeah. So you talked a little bit about, you know, the current sensors and tools that are being used now. How has that changed just even within the last year or two? 
I mean, what are we doing now that we weren't doing very recently? Um, you know, with some of the more hypertemporal multispectral sensors like planets, doves, um, we have better coverage of, to get situational awareness. Um, we also have more commercial SAR sensors in the form of ISI and um, Capella sensors. Um, we also have more LIDAR data that's just available from uh, different mun municipalities flying their, um, their areas more frequently or with drones. Uh, so there's been a lot more data modalities that have been added in the last year. And what about the things that, you know, the technology that exists that we, you know, it, we could be doing really cool things, but maybe we're not yet. Like, what are those things that you know exist out there and could be really great, um, but for whatever reason are just not being integrated into the process right now? You know, I think a lot of things are still stovepipe for, um, for some things. I think that the research community, like, and what Krista's a part of, is doing some really interesting science that is looking at fire climax fuels and invasive species that can make fires more severe, spread more quickly, that type of thing. And I, I think that translation from university to actual um, implementation can sometimes be a little bit slower than I think some of us would like. I think there is more of that happening. Chris actually hosted a, uh, an event earlier this year with ASPRS, um, the Remote Sensing Professional Society, hi, um, that brought like the Air National Guard, that brought, um, you know, myself, Krista, university people, commercial organizations, um, all together to talk about the, the fire community. And that was an amazing event for us to get to know one another and also see what some of the challenges in advancing our field with some of the newer technologies and knowledge that we have. And we have Krista. She Yay. was lovely enough to join her, join Thank us. Um, we were just saying, you know, it's been a year that we've been doing this show uh, and we still have Zoom issues. It's amazing, <laughs> isn't it? It is pretty crazy. Yeah, I was thinking about it. Like I wore this sweater a year ago for my first Zoom class and you'd think we all be pros is it at it by now, but like, yeah. Whatever. I just wanted to arrive fashionably late. <laughs> yeah. It's okay. I've lived my life based on that principle. So, <laughs> so um, you know, I did give a very, very brief introduction, but I think, uh, you know, before we continue, I'll let you give your own introduction of just, you know, the work that you're doing and briefly the stuff that you covered at Spectral Sessions. Yeah, absolutely. Sounds great. So, Hi, it's so good to see all three of you. <laughs> and hello to everyone out there. Um, I am Krista West. I'm a San Diego State University, University of California, Santa Barbara joint doctoral program student. Uh, so I'm in year two of the PhD process. I'm currently in my UC Santa Barbara year, although I'm still actually geographically located in San Diego. And I was able to speak with a number of you during spectral sessions, which was super awesome. Um, and so basically my research objectives revolve around using moderate spatial resolution satellite imagery to identify and quantify grasses, um, ideally invasive grasses uh, because they're a, a flammable or a flashy fuel. And in the event of a wildland fire, uh, they tend to, to ignite a little bit uh, faster and spread a little bit quicker, particularly in one of these extreme wind events that we often have out here in California. Uh, so by locating those areas, uh, it will help with mitigation and, and preparation steps prior to the start of a fire. And I'll be using Landsat data. And the idea with that is I can go back in time to 1984 and look at how uh, shrubland ecosystems have decreased over time and where they've been possibly replaced by this herbaceous vegetation, these grasses and forbs, uh, and see how that's affected the wildfire regime. So that's, that's my goal. <laughs> and, you know, we had talked about very briefly before you came on, um, just, you know, those four stages of the life cycle. Um, and I'd asked Amanda, you know, what are the technologies that exist out there right now that we are not taking advantage of? 
Um, do you have some thoughts on that? Well, what did Amanda say, just in case? <laughs> so that I don't, or did you, did you already say, so I don't just repeat your amazing words of wisdom. <laughs> if you repeat it, that means it's good. Say something different, Krista. I, I <laughs> um, I think, so was your question for all, all of the stages or just the first? Yeah, any of them. I mean, just, I, I know that, that there's always a gap between when technologies are released and when they're actually being put into practice. So I was just curious if, you know, your insights on what are those technologies that you would love to see get into the toolbox sooner? Yeah, I mean, I would love real-time data, not, you know, a day later, not, not even a few hours later, like real-time data. That's my, if I was queen for a day, that's what I would wish. <laughs> um, I want to know what's happening at the active fire front. And I want that information to be relayed to the incident command post and the firefighters that are fighting it at that moment. And so, you know, ideally that involves, it's, it's probably um, an airborne sensor, you know, something that's a little bit lower uh, can, in terms of altitude, can get the data to the ground sooner. Uh, and it's going to incorporate various infrared bands too, not just the, the visible bands, our RGB that we love so much, but also the near infrared, the short wave infrared, long wave infrared, so that we're learning as much as we can about how hot it is, exactly where it is, pinpoint it. Um, I think that's what's really lacking during the incident. In terms of preparation, I mean, I think that there's always more to learn and I'm all about lifelong learning. Um, I think we're at an okay spot right now in terms of data. Like it's pretty amazing what we can do with supercomputers and, and what we're collecting. It's sort of a matter of uh, conglomerating it and making sure that it's available to those who need it and can use it. And, and same with post-fire uh, research. You know, there's, there's a lot of data sources out there, but every time you know, I feel like I'm kind of aware of, of the different sensor systems and the different um, user interfaces that I can utilize in order to learn more about the data. But I feel like I learn something new every week. And there are so many times when it's like, did you know about this? No, did you know about this? <laughs> no. <laughs> and it really comes in handy if we can all talk to each other and educate one another about that. So I, yeah. And, you know, I typically I would wait to do questions, but we actually had one that popped up um, that I think is relevant here. Matria, do you want to take that? Yeah, so you touched on it a little bit, but um, do you believe that drones and aircraft are better suited versus satellites for fire monitoring, um, you know, in those high risk areas, just because of how quickly you can get the information versus the lar longer delay that you would have in the case of satellites? Do you want to go, go Amanda, go for it. Go for it, Amanda. Hi, Pierre, by the way. <laughs> yeah, hi, Pierre, my friend in the Twitterverse. I hope you're well. Um, so there's a couple things with drones. I think drones can certainly provide faster time information. The one thing that makes it an issue with fires, at least active ones, is with flight resources like aircraft who are dropping slurry. Drones can be a hazard in those situations. And so that ends up, it, it makes it kind of like a, a dual issue. You have to be very careful with your timing if you are going to do drone flights. And then the other issue that, um, I mean, drones are getting better and faster in terms of doing any kind of onboard processing, but actually, you know, the volume of data that, that drones collect, even thermal can be just enormous. So having to ortho rectify that and then get that data to somebody can, can be a challenge. But I think that's one of those things where we're getting closer to having an answer with that. Uh, what are your thoughts, Krista? I completely agree with everything that you said. I think what's excellent about the ability to use satellite data, whether it's you know, Landsat or Sentinel or Modus and Veers um, is you get that really high level picture. And if we're gonna have these uh, extremely large incidents like our August complex, our, our mega fire, um, we wanna be able to image that and at a certain spatial resolution um, that's useful to be able to capture the, the full scene and relay that information. It's it's all about trade-offs, right? You know, our spatial and, spe and temporal and spectral resolution. 
um, and, and what's going to work for the needs of of that particular incident. And in particular with the wildland urban interface, I think that's where it's really helpful to have UAVs and satellites and just leverage all that data. But then as you mentioned, that's, that's a lot of data. <laughs> and, you know, not to step too far back away from where we are with the technical conversation, but there's a piece that I've always wondered about, um, just the organizational level, you know, there's a lot of moving pieces that need to work together and work well together, you know, national, statewide, regional, cities. You know, what are the challenges there? Amanda? So, so one of the biggest challenges is, um, is these organizations being stovepiped from one another to some extent. So like if you have, sorry, my cat's meowing. Um, <laughs> I don't know why. Anyways, when you're dealing with like state, national, local volunteer fire, you're having like, you know, a type one or type two incident that would be like at the state or federal level is getting information like the imagery Krista was talking about, like, you know, Forest Service used to have a method that basically they collected the, you know, the thermal data was processed overnight, it was passed out the next day. And getting that data to everybody in real time was always a challenge. Um, you know, we've had some success in this past year uh, with a technology we've de developed called Jaguar that, that actually federates data. So uh, the different organizations can all see the same holding. So it's not like you know the Forest Service has one thing and Air National Guard has one thing and somebody else has something else. Everybody sees what everybody has. And I think that's one of the barriers that, that can break down um, and you know, having, I've I served on our local fire department board. I never was in any kind of firefighter. I can't back up my own car. Um, so we, um, <laughs> having that level of communication, I mean, there were weekly chiefs meetings that there, there was very good coordination on the ground between, um, you know, from the lowest volunteer level to state level at a regular interval talking about what new technologies are coming on board, who are the new players? I mean, the level of communication, I will say in the firefighting community, I, I think is excellent. I mean, there's always things that can be improved, but I, I personally, from what I witnessed, I thought it was pretty darn good. How about you, Krista? Amanda mentions Jaguar, which is awesome. And, and I've been seeing over the last few years, um, introduction of, of other softwares and technologies that, um, sort of make this conversation a little bit easier uh, when they're working in active incidents. Um, again, not a firefighter, uh, so I, I can't you know, talk to how it's actually working when they're deployed. Um, but one of the organizations with which I used to work in Terra has created this geospatial software that's used by firefighters, both metropolitan and wildland fires. And one of their goals is exactly what you're talking about, uh, taking all of that information and all of that data and making it available to anyone that would need it. Um, you know, the department that is responding to the incident or any mutual aid that come in. So it's it's exciting. It's really cool how it's improving and, uh, you know, everyone has a, a phone in their pockets. So <laughs> why not look at a map? Why not add incident points and, and useful items on there? Yeah, that common operating picture that Intera provides is really, a, a critical piece in being able to communicate across departments, divisions, and, and state and local entities for mutual aid. Because I mean, none of these fires ever get fought in a silo, especially the ones that once they exceed a certain level, you're going to have people come in. So having that that common operating picture, having common data assets, they're, they're just it's critical. Well, and with the common assets too, I'm thinking. I mean. You tell me, I'm not super familiar with the software, obviously, but you know, are the same tools being used at every stage of the life cycle? You know what I'm saying? It's like if, if someone is using one set of tools here and another set of tools there, like how do you make sure that they're all working together? Is that a dumb question? No, it's a good question, Abby. <laughs> <laughs> you guys looked very puzzled. <laughs> I mean, it's a good question in the sense that I, I think at a at a state level, and, and I'm I'm hypothesizing here. I you know I haven't I 
existed necessarily in that world. I, I could see at a state level or you know more of a local level, you could have different tools that maybe you've used to map your district. Um, but in the end, if you have common data types, common file types, usually you can have di disparate systems that are going to talk together. Um, and use some of the same uh, data types. I mean, that's one of the things that that we've really emphasized with the ND software over the years um, is having that interoperability between our software with Esri data going into Intera. Um, there's there's a lot of places where where things can coexist together. Was that a babble? No. Any additional thoughts, Krista? What she said. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm kind of curious, you know, Krista, you're working on more of the prevention mitigation side. Um, like, you know, obviously the spotlight is on active events when they're happening. Um, you know, suddenly it's on CNN and it's everywhere. Um, how do you make sure that mitigation and prevention efforts aren't lost in that spotlight? How do you make sure that we continue to take them into account? It's tough, right? You know, as we watch these wildfire seasons getting longer and longer and extending to basically the entire calendar year, we're kind of losing that, that time frame when education and mitigation and preparation kind of used to, to have those, those steps laid out for us. I think, I think the important thing is um, educating the communities and you know, everyone is really fantastic about this. The fire departments are incredible with the messaging that they put out um, and they're doing what they can. The cities, the counties, it's it's really impressive. Um, and I know they're working extremely hard, but there's always people that don't, don't receive that message, you know, whether it's, you know, oh, we don't have Facebook or, oh, we don't have a TV or, or there's something that's lost. And so I, I think it's just like really hammering in that education, like, hey, you are in a wildland fire prone area, you need to prepare now because the second something happens, you need to be ready to go. But instead of making it an extreme emergency at the time, here are the steps that you can take first. You can uh, yep. prune your bushes and rake the leaves and, and get that away from your house, a certain perimeter, and then do a little bit of extra weed mitigation further out. You know, if you're able to, upgrade your roof from wood shake to, <laughs> to tile, ceramic tile, you know, home hardening. Um, it's tough, it's tough, right? And I think we get this reminder every time, like you say, when we see it on the news, you see the, the flames and, and the people who didn't know it was coming and, and it's, it happens so fast. And no matter how much work we do to um, attempt to know exactly when it's going to happen. It depends on so many factors, right? There's the wildfire behavior triangles, there's topography, fuels, and, and weather, and it's totally dependent on all those sides of the triangle, and you don't know what you're going to get until until the day of. So the education and the, that mitigation beforehand is crazy important. Well, and like, so I launched a poll and asked people, you know, do you live near or in a wildfire hotspot? You know, we came back at about 25%, which actually uh, is a pretty decent amount. But I also wonder, do you think everyone has an accurate sense of, you know, what that zone is? Like, do you think, you know what I'm saying? Like, how, I'm, in, I'm in the East Bay, I'm in Oakland. Like, I'm not really concerned about, you know, tall buildings and, and whatnot, the fire getting that far, but maybe I should be, I don't know. Like, you know, how do you assess that, Amanda? Um, I think you have a really good point. Um, I have a friend who lives out in Ray, Colorado, which is in quote the tri-state area of South Dakota, Nebraska, and Colorado. Um, and you know, it's plains, but they've had to evacuate for wind-driven lightning fires. It wouldn't have been an area I would have thought prone to fire. Um, the same thing with Boulder City. Um, which is what I live next to, is I know from experience that if a fire gets out of the foothills, it can get into the city. And there you do have mature trees. You do have older roof types. And it, it's pretty frightening when you actually start to think about like how close it can get to cities that we think are, are in safe place. I mean, you said 
you know, Oakland Abbey. I mean, Berkeley's not that far, and there was some pretty pretty nasty fires there a while back. But yeah, I I think you're right. It might be underestimated. Yeah, there's still. Uh, yeah, I, I wasn't living here then, but uh, people, when you drive down um, 580, people are talking about, oh yeah, those in the hills, in the Oakland Hills, that was all gone. <laughs> it was all burned to the ground. So it's all new homes. Um, it's, it's pretty crazy. Do you have anything you want to add, Krista? I, I just want to echo what Amanda's saying. And, you know, even if you think that you're, you're not right against the wildland urban area, um, make sure you're aware of the, the weather in particular that, that you're having. We have a lot of fires that get started in places because an ember has flown in. Uh, we had an extremely windy day and it was very dry out and all it took was an, an ember to come in and, and catch fire. So, um, and I mean, if it's, if it's not wildfires, depending on where you live, it could be tsunamis, it could be earthquakes, it could be tornadoes, you know, hurricanes, like <laughs> extreme snow, like y'all had in Colorado. So yeah. just, just make sure you know what's most likely to affect your area and, and prepare for that. So Madria, we've had uh, a number of questions come up. So I'm going to hand it over to you to direct those to our panel. Yeah. So uh, one of the questions that was asked was in terms of can we use the same type of technologies in terms of the data capture and data analysis on you know, other types of disasters like lava flow? And how does that work? I'll go ahead and you can actually, you can certainly do that. Um, I mean, obviously you have more geologic information than you would in a, a fire in terms of predicting where you might have a lava flow or have an explosion of, of that type or mud flow. Um, but in the end, it's it's surrounding awareness. And I saw another kind of question down about like, you know, well, how do you focus on, you know, the areas before a fire? And it's not only knowing what vegetation you have around that that might be flammable, but it's also knowing what buildings are there. It's knowing what in what roads are in and out of an area, and how you can you know best evacuate people. So whether it's you know, you're detecting heat and you're you're predicting where you think the lava flow may go based on topography and then alerting the residents there, or you're looking at, okay, well, the lava flow might go here, but we know there's, a, there's no vegetation or there's a lot of vegetation and we might have some more issues with evacuation. So there's, yeah, there's very, there's a lot of cross-pollination between disaster management for, for many different kinds. Krista, do you want to take the same question? Yeah, I mean, definitely for, for lava flows, that's when we're going to be using technologies that have those, those infrared bands. And so it, it depends on the, the research objective you're attempting to, to answer or question that you want to answer. But yeah, totally, we can use the same technologies because we can look at temperatures, depending on the sensor that we have access to, or, or just location. Um, I know it drives people crazy, but I think a lot of my answers to questions are often, you know, yeah, sure, it depends, because it totally depends on that specific research objective that you're pursuing. Um, but yeah, in terms of data capture and analysis, absolutely, Renee, good question. Okay, do you want to ask another one, Matt? We had like eight come in at the same time. So. <laughs> yeah. um, so I'll ask this next one. Is it possible to estimate the uh, water resource contamination after a fire by you know, using remote sensing? Chris, do you want to take that first? Or actually, Amanda started, so go right ahead. No, 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 no. I've been taking them first. Krista, you go. <laughs> I'm, I kind of do want to defer to Amanda on this one. I think that All you right, will right. know better. <laughs> Um, as far as water contamination, at least in the foothills here, a lot of it is creeks. Um, so uh, creeks are a little bit harder to study than like, let's say, and you know, a big lake like Lake Erie or something like that. So you, sometimes you have to estimate debris flow, which you can do with burn severity indices. So there's an index that does the pre and post fire and can detect, um, like, did the fire burn all the way down to the soil or is there still some land cover there? And if you have a less severe fire, you probably have less debris flowing into water. If you have more severe, you're gonna have more debris flow. And um, 
if you're able to get a clear line of sight, which you may have to do with a drone or, or something like that into a creek, you can usually look at turbidity. Um, it, it also depends on the water flow. If you just have like white water, it could be really difficult, but that's where like secondary indicators, like just guessing at, okay, we think this much debris might be moving. And you can also look at downstream um, stream gauges. Sometimes we'll collect um, information about um, uh, what is the word? dissolved solids or, or just sand or that kind of thing that's in the water. If you have debris flow going into like a reservoir, that type of thing, then you can get into more remote sensing water quality tools, which will look at um, that can look at something like secchi depth. So that's how far you can see into water. So if you have really turbid water and you can't see very deep, um, there are some remote sensing indices that can be a proxy for that. You typically need a few more bands than like a, a four band sensor, but, but it's possible. Anything to add, Krista? Not, not really. Amanda covered it really well. I just, I think the only time I've really looked at water resource contamination or just water contamination in general was uh, the debris flows in January 2018 in Montecito, California, right after the Thomas fire. Um, that was pretty impressive to see the the plumes of, of mud and and debris that, that went into the ocean right there. Um, and so, yes, I think it's uh, definitely possible to estimate contamination. Um, but it's going to depend on the the sensors that you have available to you and all the all the good it depends answers. <laughs> you brought up a good point, though. I mean, being in Colorado, I didn't think about the ocean just because it's so far. But that's an excellent point. Is that yes, it you can really see those plumes in the water, and in those cases, I think you do have a better chance at either mapping out the extent of those plumes and maybe making a guesstimate on on volume. Um, so yeah, that's a really good point to bring up is, and that happens in Australia as well. You see that kind of thing and. Yeah, it helps when you have a big water body, so it's easier to imagine. <laughs> Not Boulder Creek. <laughs> well, and on that note too, I mean, I'm, I'm sure you guys saw the poll that I, I launched about, you know, just like how are people being impacted and not surprisingly, environmental health impacts are number one. So even if people don't live in the area, you know, you don't have to live close to be impacted by that stuff. Do you think uh, as attitudes with climate change and just the science around it has, you know, advanced and changed, do you think that's changing the way that we are approaching the threat of wildfires and, and other disasters really in general? Krista? I, I think so. Um, I've noticed that you know, and it could just be the algorithm that I have on my app for news now, but I mean, everything that I have, there's a lot of uh, climate change headlines that come up and certainly discussions going into just how much more extreme uh, these natural disasters are. You know, it's not just a fire, it's a mega fire. <laughs> it's, <laughs> it's not just a hurricane, like it's legit covering half of the US. So, um, I, I do think that people are starting to to look into it more. And, and that's one of those questions that it's really tough, you know, is it like with fires, you know, I'm looking at fuel driven versus wind driven fires. That's one of the factors. And so with climate change, did the drought dry out the vegetation and therefore the soil? And so it's a lot more um, likely to ignite and catch on fire and spread fire? Could that be caused by climate change? It's one of those questions that there's, again, so many factors playing a role that it's it's really tough to just point and say, yep, climate change, that's it. Um, I just, I'm noticing trend-wise just more extremes over time. Amanda, any additional thoughts? Yeah, you're, I mean, Chris is spot on. Things have, things have started to change noticeably. I mean, even since we were kids, um, I mean, the hurricane threat has become really enormous for our, you know, the Gulf Coast and the Eastern Seaboard. And um, I think people are more aware of it. And even so, like everybody else right now, we you know, just finished refinancing because of mortgage rates. But I had that moment of like, okay, 
if I needed to live someplace else, like how long would I stay in my house? Like, you know, I look to see like where in the United States is there like no natural disasters. And it was like, there are very few places and they weren't really places I wanted to live. Um, there's just, there's something everywhere. And the main thing is being aware of what that is for you and how you're gonna behave around it. Um, you know, the Paradise Fire, I that was the one I think it killed, like, unfortunately, like 88 people in California. When I actually looked at the satellite imagery, I mean, it, it scared me from the standpoint of it, like the valley was just a wedge and there was one way in and out. And, you know, things like that, we, we have to, in, in funding our state and local government, look at those changes and make them because otherwise we will see, you know, further loss of life to that scale. Um, because we didn't make the right decisions in planning, especially in areas that, you know, Paradise never really had that big of a fire risk, but it did then, and it made a difference then. So now, you know, when is the time to plan? Now. Yesterday. Yeah, 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 for sure. <laughs> yeah, the Paradise fire was, um, yeah, very frightening. The, the speed at which it was moving was just unbelievable. Yeah, devastating. Um, yeah. So I'm curious, just again, this is one of those questions coming from me <laughs> because it's less technical, but I'm just wondering, you know, I'm talking to you guys and your experts and I live in California where I had red skies and my apartment sealed off, you know, whatever. But I'm sure there's a lot of things that as someone in the general public, what am I not aware of? Like, what are the things going on behind the scenes that I just don't know about that would be good to know? when it comes to this stuff, when it comes to the process of um, mitigating, preventing, that kind of thing. What are the things that the public just doesn't really have a full sense of right now? That's a really big question, Abby. I know, sorry. <laughs> it's so good though, and it's so important, right? Because we don't know what we don't know. You know, what, what question do I ask if I don't even know what the problem could be? Um, I really liked what Amanda brought up when she was talking about paradise and just one road in and out. Um, take notice now of your evacuation points, your exits. Um, always have a go bag. I mean, we've got like an, an earthquake go bag. If, I, if I'm stuck at school and I have to walk home, I've got a an old pair of running shoes. I've got a backpack. I've got some, you know, granola bars just so I can walk the few miles back to the house and then we can reconvene and go from there. Um, it's just, I encourage everyone from, for me, uh, Twitter's not for everyone, but for me, Twitter has been an amazing educational resource. Um, and I encourage everyone to find something like that so that they have almost direct access to their local first responders. I followed the police, the sheriff, the firefighters, the emergency operation. And, you know, even when nothing's going on, they're always posting educational stuff that's discussing, you know, here's something you might want to think about for here's some mitigation steps, here's some preparation steps. Um, I know Cal Fire puts out a lot of great material in terms of preparing for wildfires. And I know that not everyone in here is <laughs> a Californian, but um, your local government policymakers, first responders are gonna have something like that. And that's gonna help you just know what questions to ask so that you can be a little bit more prepared. Yeah, I know yeah. personally, when I feel uh, what I think is an earthquake, the first place I go to check is Twitter right the, the quake bot I'm like wait did I really feel that just now yes I? it logs like even faster than USGS so I yeah. do too I go to Twitter because everyone's writing about it and then I get the totally. you know all the data from USGS <laughs> yeah Amanda did you want to add in anything on that question too just yeah. the knowledge gap um I, I think most communities have like a resiliency plan or have a county uh, resource like you could go to boulder county and they'll tell you about like you know here are potential things that can happen in boulder like i never thought i'd i'd have a flood living at 6500 feet that shocked me um so it'll it'll tell you what what resources resources are available what to expect um and they usually have you know if it's a forward-looking area i mean 
not a, the entire country does this. They may not have funds, they may not think that way, but in a lot of areas, they will say, okay, these are the things that we need to work on in order for our community to come back from a disaster. And part of that is the mitigation and the pre-planning and, and, and that type of thing. So I think that that's one resource that the public may may just not think to go to. And I had a couple, I had wrote down two little things that I, I personally think that we we forget a lot in the the either go bag. I, I think having a go bag is great. I don't have one set up right now. Like during fire season, we're usually pretty careful about having something like that. But the two things people don't think about very often is their medication and their pets. And both of those are obviously very critical in our lives. And having a plan either for where you will go or how you will acquire those things if you are not able to get back to your home um is is very important whether it's a neighbor or whether it's a safe deposit box that you have some important things in that's not at your home um there there are things that you can do and there's a lot of prepper sites out there if you really want to get into it oh and television shows i mean oh, yeah. come on um i'm actually we had more questions come in so i'm going to uh let matria read some of those off see if we can get some answers for people all right, let's take a look here. There's a lot of questions, so I apologize in advance. I know we're not gonna have the time to go through all of them. Um, but let's take a quick look here. Um, Lots about just which is the most accurate way or the most accurate sensor data when you're yeah. doing something like this. Yeah, a lot of like questions. Uh, yeah, a lot of questions on that, you know, what's the best way to, um, you know, to acquire that information. Um, had one question here um, in terms of the heat storms that arise during a wildfire. Um, you know, do those, how do those interfere with uh, collecting drone data, you know, and, you know, or something like low orbit planes, you know, better for using that, you know, getting that real time information. Let's go to Krista for that one. Yeah, go for it, Krista. Okay. <laughs> um, Diane, yeah, you're absolutely right. Um, you know, with the pyrocumulonimbus clouds and these crazy heat storms that we get, we would certainly be worrying about uh, drones, even big sturdy ones. Um, there are uh, companies such as the uh, Colorado Multi-Mission Aircraft, Colorado MMA, that will fly over, that will actually come out and they will um, image fires. And I think they're at a not a pilot. They're at a high enough altitude where it's okay, but they're also trained and very smart and they know where to fly and they're firefighters. Um, so they know what to expect. Um, I mean, yeah. And so NASA as well. And in terms of collecting real-time data. So, so I've worked the most with um, Colorado MMA, uh, but also FIRAS. We have Orange County Fire Authority and San Diego Fire Department have, uh, it's called FIRAS. It's a an acronym and I don't recall <laughs> how to define it, but same thing. Uh, so they're they're doing that that near real time collection, but again, they're trained professionals, they're firefighters. Uh, so they're gonna know when it's, it's safe to fly and collect data. Amanda, any additional thoughts? Uh, yeah, I mean, Krista's just spot on. I mean, little drones are gonna get tossed around with a pyrocumulonimbus, I mean, even the bigger ones, like a predator or something like that. I mean, some of these things are, are pretty large, but yeah, flying at a higher altitude usually can solve some of those problems. And these guys are, and gals are, are trained very, very carefully. Um, so yeah, that would, she nailed it. Great. Um, do we want to try to do maybe one more question, Ma? Yeah, so there's one question here that I think is kind of important in terms of the future of, um, you know, the types of jobs that folks are uh, going to be doing in the future, what can students be doing or what courses can they take now as their students, um, you know, that'll help for future jobs in hazard monitoring? Hmm. I don't, Krista's in education right now, so <laughs> oh my gosh, that's I her love bag. <laughs> <laughs> That's such a good question. <laughs> uh, what's cool about a geography major, I'm just going to totally plug geography right now, is it's so interdisciplinary. You can do anything with it. Um, I started out as geological sciences. I wanted to be a paleontologist. And then partway through, I was like, you know what? 
I really like this, this earth from above stuff. I love looking at satellite imagery. And so I transitioned and just sort of started discovering and exploring what a ge geography department has to offer. It's so much more than state capitals and, and world countries and memorizing those things. <laughs> um, but I mean, there's, there's so many options nowadays. And especially with this past year on Zoom, there's so much more that's available online. I mean, we've got Khan Academy, which was already there, but so many schools that are building up their curricula online. So it's available for more people. I think, you know, remote sensing classes are a really great way to go. I think uh, geographic information system sciences, GIS, <laughs> is an incredible skill to have. Um, just something that you even have in your back pocket, because that's a really marketable skill. Um, a lot of times, when I see job postings, it's for someone that knows something about GIS, uh, because, you know, government, research, um, everywhere, everyone needs mapping, right? You know, I mean, I'm talking to people from L3 Harris <laughs> Geospatial, so of course we all need mapping. <laughs> um, but, but any types of classes like that, or, or anything that teaches you about the world around you, geology, forestry, um, landscape ecology, meteorology, climatology, take something that's interesting to you and, and just go with it because you'll be amazed uh, where you end up. Just, just enjoy learning all the time. And it doesn't have to be classes. You know, you don't have to get a certificate or a degree, although it looks really good on a resume or a CV. Um, but NASA RSET offers remote sensing classes for free. I mean, L3 Harris Geospatial does stuff online all the time. So there's so many ways that you can pursue and, and start from baby steps and work your way up. And I think there's no shame in starting out with a like a for dummies book or a for kids book because that's honestly really helped me with my programming i was always really intimidated to program and the more i do coding and scripting i find that super useful for geospatial research and um, that's a really good skill to have too and i also just want to add to um i'm kind of like in the background chatting with amanda on this um, she's going to be sharing their email addresses so you know we had a lot of questions come in that we just we just don't have time for. Um, okay, just kidding. Mott is going to share instead. Um, <laughs> on the training stuff, so I'm sorry. <laughs> you like confusing things in the background. But we'll make sure you know people um, that we can try to get some answers to all these really good questions that are coming in. You know, uh, before we wrap up, do either of you have any specific resources that you'd like to plug or? Uh, direct people to that they can go following this conversation? Amanda or Krista? Um, can I just say one thing on the training before that? So I learned more from volunteering with our local volunteer fire department than I learned anything else about fire. Um, and that can be from being a board member where you're looking at the finances and making decisions about what equipment to buy and what's most important for mitigation in your community, that type of thing. So if you live in the you know, wildland urban interface, I, I encourage you to do that. Even if you don't, there's still ways you can volunteer for you know, local disaster squads or um, you know, getting even an EMS degree, um, it's a two year program for the most part and just understanding like, you know, how to, how to safely take care of people um, is a, uh, a great opportunity. Like our fire department would do mass casualty incident training. So you can go be a volunteer and lay on the ground. Um, but you still just kind of learn a lot about how people do that. And just to tag on to what Krista said, you know, my background's remote sensing. I know a little bit about a lot of different things, but I understand kind of the, the physics for the most part of remote sensing and, and how it can be applied to those things. So, you know, it, it depends on how you want to specialize. You know, if you're really interested in fire and how to predict that and how to prevent it, I think that there's great programs out there. If you're more interested in being kind of a generalist and being able to work across things, there are also, as Krista mentioned, uh, the NASA training programs. RIT has phenomenal training material. We've got our material that's free and online uh, for learning how to use Envy. In fact, there's some fire examples with that, I think. Um, so there, there's tons of resources. Krista, do you have any specific resources that you want to you know, plug or direct people to? 
I guess nothing super specific. I I do like to encourage during wildfire season that people check the National Interagency Fire Center website, the Enterprise Geospatial Portal. Um, that's a map of the US that shows where active incidents are, where there's hot spots. There's a whole uh, slew of data that's available to you um, because I think the most disheartening thing I see uh, online during fires is people who just, they don't know where the fire is, the news source doesn't know and they're panicking. Um, and it's obviously it needs to be taken with a grain of salt. You need to think it through. You need to listen to your first responders first, um, but it can help with peace of mind in terms of having a better idea of situational awareness of where something's happening. So I guess I guess that's the main one I wanna plug, but mostly I just wanna encourage people to, to follow their local emergency responders and operation centers just to get a better idea of how they can better prepare. Great, thank you guys so much. Um, this was an awesome conversation, even though uh, we had people popping in halfway through, what have you, it was all good. Everything was all good. Um, <laughs> Zoom. You, <laughs> so you can learn more about Krista's work. Uh, you can actually go back and watch her spectral session presentation. Um, it's available on our website and we'll link it along with the recording of this episode when it is posted. Um, remember that in the meantime, you can always watch previously recorded episodes of geospatial distancing at l3harrisgeospatial.com slash geospatial distancing. So until next time, I'll leave you with a thought that has been echoed by my panelists today. You know, make sure you're acquainted with disaster risks in your area. So whether it's earthquakes, floods, blizzard, volcanoes, or a pyromaniac that lives next door, uh, don't wait for an evacuation order before you consider that plan. So until next time, I'll see you guys later. Thank you. Thanks. Bye. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>